Hello and welcome. Dom Hale here for Mining Journal, Mining Magazine, and Australia Mining Monthly's 2024 Tailings Report. Today I'm speaking with Andrew Whitty, Senior Geotechnical Engineer at Engineering, Geoscience, and Environmental Consulting Firm Clone Crippen Berger, otherwise known as KCB. Andrew's going to be giving his thoughts on developments in the tailings management space and explaining how KCB's work is helping to usher in a new era of more responsible mining. Andrew, hi. It's good hi. to have you on. Great to be here. Let me start by asking you, Andrew, which innovations in tailings storage facility design that KCB has pioneered are you most proud of and why? That, that's a great question. Um, at KCB, we've been involved in cyclone sand tailings dam construction for many, many years. Uh, the use of cyclones is not really novel in the industry. It's used in milling applications, but as well as in um, upstream constructed tailings facilities for many, many years. Um, but KCB was really one of the pioneers for taking that technology in around the 1960s and moving it to what we call centerline raised tailings facility. So using a large portion of the sand that comes with tailings and using it as a construction material for building the downstream shells of the dam, making much uh, more stable dams, uh, much safer dams with, with large drain shells. And that was you know, used throughout British Columbia in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and KCB had a big role to play in that technology. Um, and now it's, we're seeing that technology, you know, advancing around the world. It's a pretty common practice in the United States. Um, we're seeing it moving into um, Australia now more and even some uh, tropical climates such as uh, um, Papua New Guinea or, or Panama are looking at this, this type of technology. So we're seeing big growth there. That what, what really excites me about it, and it's a big area of my practice, is, is doing cyclone sand tailings dams is the, the aspect of sustainability in that type of design, because we basically we're using the tailings as the construction material, which historically would have been an earth fill material, where we'd have to you know, develop borrow areas if we don't uh, get that material directly from the mine. Uh, so we would be looking at increased disturbance for borrowing, increased greenhouse gas emissions for the haul fleets um, to move material around. So with, with using cyclone sand, we can uh, use, a, use the a, a byproduct of the mining process directly to build the containment structures for the dams. And uh, uh, a lot of those facilities, when you're running with cyclones, it basically runs on gravity for the most part. You don't need additional power. So you're looking at whether or not you have clean power or not to run um, processes. Uh, so it really it has a lot of benefits um, to uh, dam construction by using a material that uh, is readily produced by the mine, um, which is you know really a, a cornerstone of, of the work that we do around uh, around British Columbia and the world with KCB. Understood. So that leads on to my next question: What case study would you point to that best exemplifies KCB's commitment to the continuous improvement cycle? that you know it, it is leading on from from cyclone sand and one of our our uh, key clients here in british columbia is uh, tech resources and they operate the highland valley copper mine um, in central british columbia which is is really uh, a showcase uh, for cyclone sand construction and dam stewardship uh, in the province and we've been supporting highland valley copy copper through its sort of prior operating entities well i think over 50 years now um, on that site so it's a long-running facility there's multiple cyclone sand tailings dams that some of them were um, developed in the in the 60s uh, some sort of pseudo upstream construction others now are center line constructed dams that uh, are using um, quite sophisticated techniques of analysis and design to manage uh, various site conditions. So it's really a, a great case study on, you know, how a project advances over the decades and adapts to change with the changing regulatory environment and uh, and technologies and, and is, is looking to the future 
Um, they're looking at uh, uh, expansions of their mind and are looking at new technologies and how to implement those technologies in, in an expanded facility. So uh, all of that really, really focusing on the environment, ESG, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for the province. All right. So each tailings dam is going to come with its own unique challenges. But what can you tell us about the common denominators that act to distinguish the KCB approach to design, construction, operation and closure? When we think of common denominators, what, what, what jumps to my mind is failure modes. And what we do at KCB is we really take a risk informed approach to tailings them design and management stewardship, focusing back on key failure modes. And this allows us to link each of the design elements that we put into a design clearly to a risk item. So everything is a consequence and likelihood based risk component. Um, we then can develop preventative design controls, you know, such as uh, filters where we would consider uh, internal erosion or buttresses where we would consider internal or stability uh, concerns. And then we roll on top of that operational controls and uh, the ability to do contingency planning based on um, metrics or activities where we would be measuring piezometers, for example, or measuring pond levels to be able to ex respond to, to risk during operation. So we kind of take this risk informed approach throughout the entire design process and it allows us to, to really tackle and have a very transparent um, way of communicating why each part of the design is what it is and what it, what risk does it address. The second part of that is uh, a focus on closure or closure first um, thinking when we're going from project conceptualization all the way through to actual closure, because you really have the most opportunity at con project conceptualization to affect the long-term closure outcomes of a tailings facility. Once you start building it, you, you're, the die is almost cast at that point of where you're going to end up. You can still change things, but you know, really getting in early, thinking holistically about the project, looking at you know, not just geology and, and geotechnical considerations, but geochemical, hydrogeological conditions. Um, and it allows you to explore a lot of different opportunities, such as, you know, is there the ability to segregate your tailings geochemistry, geochemically, um, that you can manage them differently in different areas. It helps you, where would you have covers at the end? What kind of water quality at the end? So it allows us, you know, to really influence that process and the thinking early on um, so that we can make the, the best long-term solution for, for the mine. So talking about influencing, KCB, I believe, contributed to the development and release of the global industry standard on tailings management, the, the GISTM. What was the nature of that contribution, Andrew? KCB, we, we, we kind of contributed both directly and indirectly, I would say. Um, our direct involvement, we were uh, included in the, in the sort of pre-public review and the public review process of the draft standard as it was being pulled together. And we sat down within KCB, pulled senior professionals from our various offices and developed internal workshops to kind of split the, the proposed standard into, into the, the topics and, you know, have discussions on what we think about the section, where the pitfalls could be. Um, we were really focusing on clarity of wording, um, you know, because the definitions really do matter. Uh, we, were, we were focusing on auditability, you know, what sounds like a great idea in one part of the standard is, you know, how is this in put into practice? How can we provide evidence that you would meet that requirement when we're actually working on a structure? So really looking at practical applications to the principles. Um, and I think that feedback went back into the process and we saw some change um, as it was rolled through um, to where it is today. Indirectly, um, a lot of our clients are ICMM member companies. So we work with them regularly on dam safety, governance, stewardship, and a lot of the discussions we have with them are mirrored in the GISTM through the ICMM involvement with PRI and UNEP, uh, pulling the whole, the whole standard together. 
And a lot of the shared values that we have with, with the ICMM member companies, you can see in there such as risk assessment, um, the role of the engineer of record, um, areas that we've discussed at length with our, our people that, that's in our industry groups, such as the Canadian Dam Association, the International Commission on Large Dams, uh, Mining Association of Canada, that tackle a lot of those topics head on um, in a very, you know, sometimes in a narrow sense for a specific bulletin or guidance document. And then it gets rolled into the, the GISTM and the, the what then later the ICMM good practice guide. So we see an indirect involvement through our just general work that kind of filtered all the way through. And we saw a lot of good uh, uptake on a lot of those good principles. Well, staying then with the GISTM, one, it requires a, a robust design that considers credible failure modes, what it doesn't appear to do is prescribe factors of safety for stability. Is it then your hope that the standard develops into something rather more prescriptive? You know, I don't I don't think the standard really needs to get too prescriptive um, because, you know, every tanks facility is different and unique. There are kind of basic standards of safety that we want to adhere to. Um, you know, factor safety seems like a very simple thing to prescribe, but it can be abused if uh, the incorrect assumptions are made in getting to that, uh, you know, that calculated value. I think the standard, in my opinion, really focuses on the governance level. You can see that in the, the kind of GISTM graphic that they created with affected communities at the center, which is, which is a great kind of overlay of the six topics um down to the principles and the requirements and it really hits at that governance level the technical organizations as i mentioned um canadian dam association or 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 you know commission on large dams they're really hitting at the prescriptive engineering aspects of tailings dams and you know factor of safety specifically was really um well addressed in one of the i cold recent bulletins on uh, i think it's 194 on on dam safety that's come out and, and really looking at taking ideas of, and this is, you know, the geotechnical specifics of brittleness in strength of tailing, strength of foundation materials and how that relates to the computation of factor safety. So they've done a really good job of that and provided that guidance. Um, and I think that's, you know, not necessarily the role of the GISTM if it, if it ended up getting there or linking back to that, um, that's fine. But I think GISTM really hits on that, that governance level. Understood. And um, so finally, then, Andrew, for an area of focus, arguably previously overlooked, tailings management is fast becoming a critical consideration for mining companies post Rumadino. Do you think then the introduction of the GISTM will now act to keep mines and budgets sufficiently focused in the long term? You know, we, we, there is a, a, a lot of talk on the post um era, and and in in British Columbia, where where we're focused or where we're, where we're sitting, you know, we we really st started to see change happen in 2014 with the the Mount Polly tailings dam failure here in British Columbia. We started to see a lot of change happening, a lot of discussion um, on things like, as I mentioned, engineer of record, adequate site characterization, governance. And that was really, you know, exacerbated and brought to the forefront of the investment community in uh, 2015, 2019 with the, uh, the Brazilian failures. You know, GISTM really can be leveraged by the financial system um, to raise, I think, to raise the bar on tailings management and really an accountability, the governance structures, ESG. Um, but it is, it's a little bit narrowly focused on only tailings. And we've seen quite a few organizations adopting somewhat more holistic approaches, such as the Mining Association of Canada's towards sustainable mining uh, initiatives that, that you know, expands that thinking and those layers of governance into other aspects of the mine related to you know, entire watershed stewardship, um, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions across the mine, you know, not just looking at the tailings facility, but looking at the open pits, the mine fleet, how power is used in the mill, um, health and safety overall. So really putting a focus and expanding that. Um, I think regardless of the system or the standard that, that we apply, we are in a different world. Um, and there is a lot of focus on tailings. 
one of the biggest challenges will be a focus on capacity and competency building. I think at the different levels of both the mining companies, the engineering professionals, the in educational institutions, the regulators, um, to really keep that at um, the forefront of, of the industry. Um, we just don't have enough people right now to do all the things that are in the standards. So, you know, the standard itself um, is a really good step forward. A lot of great ideas in there. Um, but we need to be looking at the, you know, the industry as a whole, education, capacity building, um, in order to keep keep this uh, trend going over the long term, I think. Well, Andrew Whitty of Clone Crippen Burger, thank you very much for your time and for your valuable insights today. I'm Dom Hale. Thank you for watching.